I think it all began with the, uh, with the knowledge that, that I had from my father who had served in a World War I. And, uh, and he never let us forget that, you know, that, that it was a, an honor to serve for one's country. And, uh, and he encouraged my older brother and myself when we became of age to, to consider being in the military. And, uh, and I think it, 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 it left a great impression when we, we felt that uh, you know, we were really following in our father's footsteps at that time. I was 18. The people that I had gone to school with and, uh, and had grown up with, they were doing the same thing. And you felt that you know, there must be some underlying strong reason that these young people are enlisting and uh, prepared to serve their country. And, and I think it, it sort of instilled a sense of duty into a person that it, it wasn't for self. It was for country that you were really, really concerned about, because because I think you know at, even at that age, uh, you began to realize that uh, things could happen to your country, and if you lost the freedoms that you had, you would never get them back. Everyone started out in the infantry, unless you had some special training that qualified you to go into another branch of the service. And then, then you sort of evolved into something else. I started out in the Canadian Infantry Corps, of course, as, as basic training. Then I, I spent some time in the Canadian Service Corps. And then when, when things began to sort of gel, when the war was sort of closing down, they, they gave us an opportunity to, to select another unit. And uh, I, I don't know why a good number of us chose to go to the Prince of Patricia's. And uh, it, it was quite a, an experience to be, uh, become part of that, that particular uh, group of, uh, of military people. And I think it was in 1919 that, that the uh, young, young captain uh, was training with, the, with part of the group that, that formed the Regina hockey club at that time, and they, 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 they named the Regina Pats in honor of the Patrician Battalion. Indian Head had had a, in those days it was called the Non-Permanent Active Militia. It had a battery for many, many years. And uh, when it mobilized, it joined with the 60th Battery from Aneroid to become, it was originally the 60th slash 76 battery. That's how it was mobilized. And then it was divided later into two separate batteries. When I learned that the battery was being mobilized, I went down in July. I was then a clerk in a book and a bookkeeper at a store. So I went down to see about joining and explained. As a matter of fact, I ended up uh, talking to the battery commander, who was Major Bolter. And he said, well, you could join now. And I said, no, I can't, can't because I have an obligation to tidy up my books for the end of the month. He said, well, you could join and give you leave. And I said, well, I would sooner wait and come back tidy. So I went home, finished up, and come back on the 1st of August to join. I, I suspect it was the fairgrounds in Indian Head where we had a camp with tents and, and kitchens were set up and that sort of thing. So we started our basic training there. And we did have a couple of guns, old 18-pounders, that we started with basic gun drill. But from Indian Head, we went to Camp Petawawa in, in Ontario, which is now a big a permanent camp. And as I remember, the place we lived in wasn't quite finished in the sense that there were still carpenters around. And I, as I remember, we, we went there in November, I think, I'm sure, and uh, the huts weren't particularly good. The heating system, you know, was a, a heater in the middle of a, a barrack block along one H hut, uh, along one side of an H hut, and uh, but we managed. Uh, they set up canteens and kitchens, and there were places uh, where uh, lessons indoors. So uh, it was pretty intensive for that winter. And at that point, we got our first colonel. We were operating then as a 60th battery, 76th, and then an, a battery from, well, a lakehead and Portage La Prairie, which was the 37th battery. So the 37th, the 60th, and the 76th made up the 17th Field Regiment. And we had 
an officer come back from England to be our commanding officer. That was Colonel Thackeray, who was a regular soldier and a First War veteran. We went from Petawawa to England. Waterloo West Barracks in Aldershot, England. We were there, I think, November, and I came back the next, late the next May. I had been recommended for a commission, and uh, I guess if I'd stayed in, if the regiment had stayed in Canada longer, I probably would have attended officer training in Canada, but I went to England, and at that time, I understand that General McNaughton said the Canadian candidates would no longer go to the British officer training school. They would come back to Canada uh, after they were com commissioned to do a tour of duty as instructors and then go back overseas. And that's, I was one of the, f I think my batch, if I can use that term, was the first big one that came back. It was pretty t tough having taken down three stripes and a gun and then being chased around by a lance corporal. <laughs> that's what hurt, but you had to get used to it. I think it was part of the, part of the system. The first two months were basically infantry training, basic tactics. And then in the final month, if you were going to be a signaler, you went to the signal wing or the artillery wing or infantry or whatever. And then we went to, to Brandon. And then I went back as, out there as a teacher for three months to the basic school. And it was quite a, quite a difference being on the staff <laughs> and being a cadet. And I refused to tolerate this silly nonsense of being chased around the circle when you forgot something. February 42, uh, in Calgary, I joined HMCS Tecumseh. I was in high school, 17. I wasn't doing very well. I was a dandy football player, but that was the limits of my skills. I was in the Reserve Army, I mean, uh, and I was a signalman, so I knew how to operate Morse code which was a skill that was needed in the Navy, but uh, I wasn't that enamored with uh, the dust and the dirt of the Army. So I uh, tried the Air Force and they caught me with my eye. I'm blind in one eye. And so I went to the Navy and I cheated my way through the medical. I went like, read the chart this way, and then I read the chart this way and I got through. And so I was trained in a secret school in Ottawa. Do you know uh, Stevenson, the, the famous story of uh, the, the, about Enigma? The, well, we were the frontline troops for that, for that effort. Uh, we did the direction finding and so forth for that, and so I was trained in Ottawa for that for, oh, about uh, two months. Well, I was assigned to Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and there was a shore station there, and I went there for another couple of months and then was drafted overseas picked up a new ship in, in England, HMCS Sioux. Uh, and we had the two ships there, the Algonquin and the Sioux. They were sister ships built side by side. They were fleet class destroyers. They're lighter than the tribals and faster. I joined in the 7th of July, 1940. But I must tell you how we wound up there. We were on a farm then. And and a friend of mine lived in town in Gilbert Plains, Manitoba, and we used to meet up and we were fooling around, standing on our heads beside the sidewalk, and he wore glasses. He took them off and put them down, and I reached out to grab them, and I stepped and broke the glasses. And then, of course, we had a bit of a get scramble. I had to pay for him $1.75 to fix that side of the glasses. <laughs> he said, well, Hell with it, why don't we join, join up? And his uncle was a colonel in Winnipeg, so that's what we did. We went to Winnipeg and, and I joined up then. But I was an old fellow when I joined up in 19. Started out in Winnipeg and then Camp Shallow, Manitoba. And uh, when the, it, was, it was an Army Service Corps, but I was attached to, the, to a field ambulance. We were stationed, used to have to go to London quite a bit, and we were, I lived, we were down in a place called East Grinstead there. And uh, talking about bombing, this uh, evening, in, uh, about, well, about five o'clock in the afternoon, there was a big theater there. You've probably heard about it, getting all blown up. And, and uh, we spent all that night there rescuing people. There was 360 some people who were all. And it would have got a lot more in the, the theater was all blown to bits. 
I was born in Henryburg, Saskatchewan, which is about 20 kilometers northeast of Prince Albert. I was raised on the farm and uh, of course we had to do some fall work and those days was with horses and uh, I said to my father, would you be able to buy a tractor this fall? The neighbors have all got tractors. No, as long as we've got hay, we'll always have horses. Well, I said, I'm tired of horses. Would you take me to the bus station and I'm going to join the army? And that was August 1944, four days before my 18th birthday. They put me into infantry because they were always short of infantry men. And infantry men is the ones that are in front line. So it's, uh, it's quite a job. And from there, I think they sent me to Camrose, Alberta for basic training. And that was two months. And from there, Curry Barracks, Calgary. And I was another two, two months there. And from there, back to Dundurn and worked in administration for quite a while. I injured a foot and I was not fit to go overseas. So I was detailed to jobs like regimental police or kitchen duty or anywhere I was needed. Once I was fit again, I volunteered for Japan, but we were, I think there was 155 of us on a troop train on the way to Camp Vernon, BC. And we only got as far as Kamloops, BC that night. They stopped the train and informed us the war was over. I was born and raised in a small town outside of London, Ontario. It's called Belmont. I'm the eldest of four children. And war ex started in 1939, and many teen friends joined. And pretty soon, many friends were away on course or overseas, and I felt rather lonely. When I was 18, I decided that I would join the service as well. I had no objections from my parents. My father was thrilled that one of his children was going to join. Many, of even my family, were already in the Navy, and I thought it was pretty smart. But I also felt lonely in my small town with so many friends go away, gone away that I wanted to be where they were. So I did join the Navy in London, and immediately they gave me a ticket to go on the train to Windsor, Ontario. Well, I had never been on a train alone. I'm uh, just a small town girl, and they gave me a ticket for a meal, and someone would meet me in Windsor at the station. I got off the train and didn't see any sailors or girls in uniform at all. Well, then I really felt more distressed about the situation. I went to the station master and said, where is the Navy ship? And they told me it's five blocks down the street. I thought, well, I guess I got to hoof it. So I did. I checked my baggage there and walked five long blocks to HMCS Hunter, a small front on the main street in Windsor, and a sailor was outside and he took one look at me and I took a look at him and he said, can I help you? I said, I was supposed to be met at the station. Oh my God, he said, wait here. So immediately uh, he brought out a female. Well, if you think they weren't apologetic all over me as so embarrassed, so they forgot to meet the train. They took me to a whole house two doors down and said, you will stay here. There will be other girls coming along. No uniform. I didn't know any regulations. And, and I really felt left alone, not nobody really caring. Finally, after supper, the female 
who I later found out was a wren, came up to me and uh, she said, have you eaten? And I said, no. Well, why didn't you come on board ship to eat? Well, nobody told me. Didn't know. So anyway, the officer of the ship took me in and sat me down and gave me all the rules and regulations. And the next day, two more girls arrived and then it ended up there were 25, all from Ontario, a few from Quebec, but 25 of us untrained, no uniform, and put on an apron and go to work in the kitchen. Anyway, they decided they had to get a uniform for us. They, we, they kitted us out, and then the officer of the watch decided we should look, here we are in uniform, we should look like we could march. So they took us down the back alley, and we learned to march left, right. Just basic direction. We were there for three months, and then they decided that we should go and take our basic training in Galt, Ontario. So we got shipped to Galt, and from Galt we, we learned to right march every direction you could want. And we felt a little insulted because we had learned a lot of that basic stuff. But anyway, you do what you're directed to. And because they said we were cooks, that we could change later, we didn't have to be cooks, we had to take a course on how to be a cook in Cornwallis. So we arrived there and the train, I remember the train pulling in and all we girls were looking out. We didn't know what it was all about. And all these sailors lined up, yay, yay, new women. And new women, they thought it was great. We were scared, I must say. After I completed my cook's course, I got posted to Stadacona in Halifax, and I was there till the end of the war, over a year there. It changed my life in making me think about me, that unless I learned, looked after myself, that I wasn't going to go anywhere. It, experience was something that I didn't have, and so I learned to think on my feet and think of me. Also, to care for my buddy beside me, I just seemed to get stronger. Well, my dad was a military man, and then uh, everybody in my class in high school, they, well, not everybody, but a lot were enlisting. So I went and enlisted too. I had tried the Navy and they wouldn't okay me. Uh, my eyesight wasn't good enough. And uh, so then I went to the Air Force and. <laughs> on uh, getting the test for your eyes, they allowed a bunch of us into the room, and I was down near with the chart, so I simply memorized the chart. And then I got up there and rattled it off, and okay, away you go. Winston Churchill, in 1940, asked Mackenzie King to supply 4,000 radar technicians to Britain because they were very, very short of radar people. So that was one thing that interested me. And so I, I put my name down for that when I went into the Air Force, and that's what I, I from Brandon, you were posted to a, a university, and I took my training at the University of Saskatchewan. And after four months there and passing the courses, you got leave, and then you were sent to a, a secret base of radar in Canada, Clinton in Ontario, and uh, you were trained on, I was trained on airborne radar. And then once you, the agreement was that once you were taking all your courses, you were immediately posted overseas and you were attached to the RAF squadrons, not Canadian. So I was attached to a number 85 squadron in West Malling in Kent. And our job was to uh, protect London from the German bombers coming in to bo uh, bomb London, the night bombers, because it was a night fighter squadron. We were trained on Mark IV radar, and when we got over there, they were on Mark VIII radar, so it advanced that fast. And uh, the third night I was there, the sergeant came in and he said, uh, 
well, we're short of guards. He said, you people go out and guard the gate. Don't let anybody wearing a German <laughs> uniform in here. And he said, be sure and wear your tin hats. So we got out there and it was a beautiful English evening. The rhododendrons were blooming and, and uh, so uh, we Canadians, we said, well, what on earth do you need a tin hat for? Well, at 10 o'clock or about that, we found out. They had the, uh, the uh, shore-based radar, the towers, and uh, they would tell you when they were coming in, what height and what direction. And uh, then we got, and then the, the control people there would signal to our squadron and say, on vector such and such, so many aircraft coming in, and up would go our boys. They were all Aussies, all our Aussie air crew. The German aircraft came over, and Mark e, uh, 8 radar was like a flashlight in the nose of the aircraft, and it beamed out, and uh, when the, the, you got a blip, the oscilloscope was right in the uh, pilot's compartment, and you got a blip at the top, you knew that he was above you. And then you just simply raised your nose, and when that formed a circle, then he was dead ahead. So all you had to do was speed up. And once you got within 500 yards of the enemy aircraft, the cannon fired automatically. Well, once they fired, the sky lit up like it was noonday. Well, you had a full bomb load. And uh, the next thing you knew, hot metal, hot aircraft parts, hot bodies, they were all following me. We ran and got our damn tin helmets. <laughs> After a while, I was, uh, the sergeant come in one morning and he said, I want volunteers for overseas. And I said, I thought we were overseas. Oh no, he says, I mean overseas. And he points in some obtuse direction. Anyway, he said, we'll give you three weeks leave right away. So uh, Johnny Gowdy from Calgary and myself were the only single ones the rest were all married out of the eight that went to, to that drone. And uh, so we, we accepted, we volunteered. So they, uh, we got away on leave. My mother came from Lincolnshire, my father from the north of Scotland. So I had a wonderful time. Came back and we were posted to Blackpool and they outfitted with a small uh, khaki kit for hot weather, and I said, we're going to the hot place. So uh, then they shipped us to L Liverpool, and from there we got on a boat and we went up to the Clyde and formed a convoy. There was quite a number of troop ships, and three destroyers and one cruiser as escort. And we headed around the north of Ireland, down, and we put in at Sierra Leone, and an English regiment got off, and they went to uh, Africa to fight Rommel. And then we put out to sea again and headed south, and the engines conked out. And the rest of the convoy just sailed off till there were little wee specks on the edge of the horizon. And we were there, dead quiet, sitting not far from the opening to the med. And we figured, uh-oh. We had it. That's when I had a little fear. I, everybody from my deck, I was three decks below the water line, so we all took our hammocks and went up to the main deck and slept on there. Well, anyway, they got the engines fixed. They were making one hell of a racket, but they got it fixed. And then we set sail at full speed, and we caught up to the convoy in a one day or a day and a half. And the uh, cruiser Commodore, he sent a message flat, and it read uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. Uh, don't quote me on the exact verse, it's 70 years ago. And uh, so somebody ran and got a Bible and looked it up, and it said, The shepherd re rejoices, for the lost sheep hath returned to the flock. Then uh, I was sent to uh, India, and I, I was at a station just outside Bombay for a while. We were servicing uh, oh, Sunderlands and so forth for coastal uh, detection of submarines. 
Then I was sent up to Drig Road, uh, number 320 maintenance unit. And I spent the whole rest of the war, two years, over two years, at that station. I tried to get off, no sir. I couldn't, I wanted to get, I wanted to get across the Brahmaputra because then you got the Burma Star. But I could, they wouldn't let me go. I ended up training English uh, ra radar people after me on the equipment and I stayed there. They told me later I was supposed to get a couple of stripes or so, but uh, RAF was very slow on doing that. <laughs>